next we're going to talk about connected sums. Uh, this is a way of taking two surfaces and gluing them together to get a, a third surface called the connected sum. Um, of course, if you've got two surfaces, you could just take their disjoint union um, and that would be <coughs> another surface, but that's a boring thing to do. Uh, in this case, we're going to take two connected surfaces uh, and combine them to get another connected surface. So let's suppose that X and Y are compact connected surfaces. Then the connected sum, which is written X hash Y, uh, is a compact and connected surface, which you obtain by cutting out small open disks, uh, D in X and D primed in Y. Uh, I've written a little zero over there. Uh, to make clear that they're interiors of disks, and then we glue the circle boundaries of x take away d and y take away d primed. So here's a picture. Um, I'm thinking about these small red disks here. Uh, I'm going to cut out the interior of that disk and the interior of this disk here, and then the boundaries are circles, so identify the circle here for x with that circle for y, that gives me a, another surface. <coughs> so it is a surface rather than the, some nasty topological space because um, each point has an open neighborhood um, homeomorphic to an open set in R2, even the, the new glue points here, and we retain the, the compactness and the Hausdorffness. <coughs> okay, so obviously the, this depends upon the choices of um, the disks and the boundary identification. Um, <coughs> what we care about really is not about the particular surface X connects on Y, but about this surface up to homeomorphism, um, up to isomorphism of connected surfaces. <coughs> um, so technically this connected sum operation uh, really depends upon the orientation that you glue the boundary circles with. So if we've got a, a notion of clockwise, uh, if we've got a notion of clockwise or orientation around that boundary circle uh, and around that boundary circle, we could have glued them to identify orientations, or we could have glued them to uh, reverse orientations, so we could have glued the two circles in the opposite order. Um, and <coughs> the orientations there would somehow, that in some sense, you might get a slightly different surface. Um, but actually, from uh, from the classification of surfaces, it will turn out that the connected sum of x and y um, does not depend uh, as a <coughs> um, as a surface on this choice orientation. That would not be true in higher dimensions. Um, so, if you want to define um, connected sums of uh, higher dimensional topological manifolds or smooth manifolds or whatever you're working with, then uh, you need to think about the orientation issues there. <coughs> okay, so we're going to ignore that at that point. Um, okay, so one thing to notice is that X connects some um, the two sphere S2 is homeomorphic to X, because if this Y here was a, was a two sphere rather than something more complicated, then what would be left of Y would be a disk. So the process of taking X connects some S2 is that you cut out a disk in S, X and then you glue a disk back in, which recovers uh, the original surface X up to homeomorphism. Um, so um, this operation of connect sum is rather like an operation of addition. Um, and S2 is like the, uh, the identity, uh, or the zero for this operation of addition. Okay, so one thing that's quite easy to work out is what the connect sum does to um, <coughs> uh, does to Euler characteristics. So uh, let's choose triangulations of x and y um, such that uh, the disks uh, which we cut out in order to glue x and y together are faces of this triangulation. So <coughs> Okay, so you, well, you could possibly do this with a subdivision rather than with a, um, a triangulation, but that will make your life more complicated. 
So here's a picture of uh, a small portion of x with there's a triangle in the triangulation. Um, there's a, ver a face, three vertices, three edges going around that triangle. Here's the same thing in y. Um, then let's do the boundary identification of these circles in such a way that we glue the um, vertices and the edges and the faces to each other in the obvious way. Okay, so let's write vx, ex, fx for the number of vertices and edges and faces in the triangulation of x, and similarly for y and for x connect sum y. So let's think about what this connect sum process does to the numbers of vertices and edges and faces. Firstly, the number of vertices of x connect sum y is the number of vertices of x plus the number of vertices of y minus 3. That's because um, three vertices in x get identified with three vertices in y. So uh, the, there are kind of six vertices here in x and y together, which get turned into three vertices in the connect sum. Similarly, the number of edges in x connect sum y is number of edges in x plus number of edges in y minus three. That's because these three edges here in x get identified with those three edges here in y which reduces the total number of edges by 3. And the number of faces in x connects on y is the number of faces of x plus the number of faces of y minus 2. Uh, and that's because uh, this disk here, that face there and that face there get deleted. Okay, so overall, um, oil characteristic of x connects on y is that plus that plus that, so that, the v minus the e plus the f. So you take these formulae, this column will give you the oil characteristic of x, that column gives you the oil characteristic of y, this column gives you minus 3 plus 3 minus 2, so the constant contributions are a minus 2 there. Um, <coughs> incidentally, if you like, you could rearrange this formula to say oil characteristic of x connects on y plus 2 equals oil characteristic of x plus oil characteristic of y. Uh, or you could explain that as oil characteristic of x connects on y plus oil characteristic of s2 is oil characteristic of x plus oil characteristic of y. Um, because 2 is oil characteristic of the 2 sphere s2. And we can understand that because x connects on y you get by kind of cutting out these disks here um, and gluing those bits together. But if you were to Glue to if you were to take the uh, the discs here and glue them together, you get a two sphere. Um, for example, if you want to do this with the whole topological space, you could cut the open disc out of X, but a closed disc out of Y, and then glue that glue those things together, and then that open disc and this closed disc uh, would together make up a two sphere. So, I told you uh, in the last lecture that all the characteristics are <coughs> additive under a process of cutting and pasting. In this case, you can take uh, the disjoint union of x and y, uh, you can cut it up and then glue it back together again to get x connects on y together with the two-sphere. Um, and that might be one reason for you to understand that the oil characteristic of x plus y plus the oil characteristic of the two-sphere equals oil characteristic of x plus oil characteristic of y. Okay, so um, you should uh, learn that formula, it's, it's useful. <coughs> okay, so let's take an example. Um, one of the important, uh, most important families of uh, surfaces are the surface sigma g of genus g greater than equal to zero, um, or which is also called the sphere with g holes, is defined to be the multiple connected sum of uh, G copies of the torus T2, uh, or it's S2 if G equals zero. So here's a picture of the surface sigma G when G equals three. Um, it's kind of a big uh, lumpy thing. Um, you could make it out of Play-Doh, uh, but you want to have three holes, um, basically. Um, and if you draw it with kind of thin necks here, you can think about this as being formed by taking uh, three copies of the torus, 
sitting them next to each other like this, and then joining uh, each adjacent pair with a small neck here. Yeah? So this, this small neck is in effect what you get by cutting out a small circle there, and a small circle there, and gluing the boundaries. If you prefer, you can glue the boundaries by gluing in an annulus like that, rather than actually um, shoving them together. <coughs> okay, so let's use our formula uh, for uh, the Euler characteristic of a connected sum to work out what the Euler characteristic of sigma g is. Um, well, so we have the Euler characteristic of S2 is 2. Um, so sigma 0 is S2, so therefore sigma, uh, the Euler characteristic of sigma 0 is 2. Uh, as in that formula. Um, and by induction, you can see that the Euler characteristic of sigma g is 2 minus 2g. Two um, <coughs> and the inductive process is that if you want to go from sigma g to sigma g plus 1, then you take the connect sum with a torus. So Euler characteristic of sigma g plus 1 equals Euler characteristic of the sigma g plus Euler characteristic of t2, which is 0, minus 2. So when you go from sigma g to sigma g plus 1, you have to subtract 2. So that's why this minus 2g is there. Okay, so you should learn this formula that the Euler characteristic of sigma g is 2 minus 2g. And in this case, uh, the Euler characteristic distinguishes sigma g for different g. So if we had a, a surface which we thought was a sigma g for some g and we were able to compute its Euler characteristic, we'd then know what the genus g is. <coughs> okay, um, another topic. Um, you can take connected sums of, of planar models. Um, so uh, let's say we have two planar models, x and y, uh, which we can we have our special notation um, writing these as, as words uh, with you know, a, a inverse and that kind of thing. Um, now, so I imagine I've got x and y, and I've selected some particular vertices here and there, which I've written in red and green. And I'm going to write these uh, as words in symbols a, a inverse, b, b inverse, and so on, by writing these clockwise round the uh, around the boundary of x starting from my chosen vertex. Now if I want to take the connected sum of something I have to cut out a disk uh, in each of these. The disk I'm going to cut out I've written as a kind of small teardrop um, which starts and finishes at my chosen vertex here um, and uh, when I cut this out it's going to have uh, a boundary which I'm going to write as a purple interval. So this part of this diagram is uh, this x together with um, with the teardrop cut out, and I'm kind of separating this vertex into two. So I've straightened out. So that you can see is this with that purple bit extending to one edge. Uh, the right hand side of that diagram is uh, again this part of y with this disc cut out, that vertex separated into two, that purple. Um, curve straightened out into a line. <coughs> and then we're supposed to glue uh, x take away that disk and y take away that disk along these um, intervals. So that gives us a picture like that. <coughs> so now let's think about what the side identifications here um, and here are doing. Um, so you know, maybe that side's being identified with this side, that side's being identified with this side, and so on. Uh, and those side identifications are given by some uh, sequence of symbols like a, a inverse, and so on going around here. And um, the same thing has happened for the y part. Now, once we've glued this edge, we can just um, delete it and uh, take those, regard these two faces as being one face. Um, so we can regard this x canux and y as a single polygon. Um, which has side identifications. So these collections of sides are being identified in pairs with each other. This other collection of sides from Y are being identified in pairs from each other. Okay, so the conclusion to this is that if X 
is represented by a word a1 up to a2k, where by these I mean symbols a, a, and verse, that kind of thing. And y is represented by a word b1 up to b2l, where we have to use different symbols uh, in the y word to the x word. Then x connected some y uh, is represented by um, the x word followed immediately by the y word. Okay, so basically we go around uh, x there, and then we immediately go around y here and return to the start. Um, so that gives you a very, and the, the planar model notation um, by representing surfaces by words is always very succinct, and um, this gives you an easy way to uh, explain connected sums of things uh, in this notation. Okay, uh, let's look at a couple of examples um, uh, in which we identify connected sums of surfaces we know with other surfaces we know. Uh, so firstly, I claim that there is a homeomorphism between RP2, connected sum RP2, uh, with the Klein bottle K. Um, so as a sanity check, uh, let's work out the Euler characteristics of both sides first. So RP2 has Euler characteristic 1, the Klein bottle K has Euler characteristic 0. So the Euler characteristic of RP2 connects some RP2 should be 1 plus 1 minus 2, which indeed is 0, the Euler characteristic is the Klein bottle. Okay, so the Klein bottle uh, we would usually write as by taking a rectangle um, and identifying pairs of sides, where I'm going to identify the top and bottom sides with directions reversed, uh, but I'm going to identify the left and the right sides with um, identification in the same direction. Okay, so this, the outer blue rectangle is telling us how we construct the, um, the Klein bottle uh, as a surface from a plane model. So now, Within this, I'm going to, to draw some extra vertices and edges. So I'm going to draw um, two extra, well, two extra vertices here that they get identified um, uh, by this pink thing, uh, and an edge going between them. I'm also going to draw a red edge from there to there, another red edge from there to there. Uh, that divides the inside of the Klein bottle into four triangles, one, two, three, four. I'm going to color these two triangles green, and those two triangles white. Okay, so um, I want to think about this as how I form a connected sum of the RP2s. So this red um, thing here, so that the red curve is actually a, a circle drawn inside the Klein bottle because that joins up to that, and then this edge joins up to that, um, and the red circle is going to be the uh, the circles in RP2 takeaway disk and RP2 takeaway disk which get glued uh, when I form my connected sum. Okay, so one way to write RP2 as a, uh, a planar model is to take a two-gon, um, that is a, uh, a, a polygon with two sides which have to be curved uh, and, and two vertices and we identify the opposite sides um, in um, in the reverse directions, and the those two vertices also get identified. So um, this thing gives us a, an RP2. I'm going to cut out a disk. Uh, my disk is um, taken by drawing a small red teardrop here, starting and finishing at that vertex, and then cutting out this red area. Here's my second copy of RP2. Um, now with its outside drawn in uh, in purple and uh, two vertices. Again, I cut out this red disk, starting and finishing that, that vertex. Um, in both of these, I've chosen to draw an extra edge um, from the other uh, vertex of the thing along to the um, cutout locus there. Okay, so now we can see that um, this RP2 takeaway disk is the white region, corresponds to this and that. This RP2 takeaway disk is the green region, corresponds to this um, 
rhombus here. <coughs> um, and then we're gluing them along the, the red curves. Um, so the discs I'm cutting out are written in red here. So if you stare at this for a while, you should be able to see that um, if you take that and that, you cut out the red discs, you identify the red boundaries, uh, you get something the same as this. Okay, so basically, <coughs> um, what well, RP2 take away a disc is a Mobius strip, what you get by taking a rectangle, uh, folding it around, then giving it a half twist and um, joining just one of the edges. Um, so here I've cut the climb bottle along a circle uh, and it's fallen into two Mobius strips. Mobius strip you can think of as RP2 uh, with a disc cut out. Okay, so therefore RP2 connects some RP2 is isomorphic to the Klein bottle. Um, okay, a second example which uh, we're going to <coughs> uh, to need later is that there are homeomorphisms between the Klein bottle connects some RP2 is isomorphic to RP2 connects some RP2 connects some RP2 and that is isomorphic to the two torus connects some RP2. Okay, so the, the first of these isomorphisms just follows in the previous example, because we take this isomorphism and then we connect some both both sides with an RP2. Um, incidentally, the uh, <coughs> we don't need to put any brackets in here because the connect sum operation is uh, essentially uh, <coughs> commutative and associative um, as far as uh, up to isomorphisms go. Uh, as long as you don't care about um, orientation issues, which we don't. <coughs> okay, um, so what we need to establish is this second isomorphism between the connect sum of three copies of RP2 with themselves and uh, the torus connect sum RP2. <coughs> okay, so uh, let's start with RP2 connect sum RP2 connect sum RP2. Um, Let's think about this as the two sphere with connected sum with three copies of RP2, um, uh, because the two sphere is the identity from the point of view of connect sum. Um, and I'm going to make a picture of this as so here's the two sphere, and the effect of connecting sum with RP2 is basically to cut out a small disk um, and identify its sides like that. So each of these three small red uh, operations here is basically connect them with an RP2. So what I'm thinking about doing here is I take my big two sphere, I cut out three red disks and throw them away, and then I, ident I identify the sides uh, which, I've, which I've, I've drawn two vertices and two edges here, and I identify the edges like that. Um, <coughs> so each of these gives me a connect sum with RP2. And the red, the red regions aren't there, uh, they're, they're thrown away, uh, these circles are being glued to themselves, as shown. Okay, so this is a way of drawing RP2, connect some RP2, connect some RP2. I want to cut it into two pieces, one of which corresponds to a T2 takeaway disk, and the other which corresponds to an RP2 takeaway disk, um, and that will give me a, a presentation of this surface as a connect sum of T2 and RP2. So in this picture, um, I've got purple lines. Um, I want to cut along them. So <coughs> actually, if you follow this, so this purple line there goes around to there, then that gets identified with that. So you can continue it there. Then you jump across to here. Then that, that gets identified with that. That jumps over to there and so on. Um, and Actually, this purple line is, is, although it looks as though it's coming in, in six, six, six segments, um, the boundary identifications uh, here <coughs> mean that, that the purple line is actually a single circle. Um, <coughs> okay, um, so we, we cut along these these purple lines, which is actually just one circle, um, and let's colour in these regions green and the remaining regions white. And note that the, the green regions under this boundary identification, that green bit gets joined to that green bit, uh, that green bit gets joined to that being rip, green bit, and so on. And again, the white, bit, white bits are joined to each other. So 
in cutting along this purple thing, which is a circle, we cut our surface, RP2 cubed, into two regions, uh, a green region and a white region. Okay, so the green region turns out to be RP2 take away a disk. In fact, it's a, well, the green region is really um, three rectangles joined at their edges. And uh, each, each edge gluing involves a kind of flip. So if you like, you've got three rectangles um, joining them together with three half twists, which is equivalent to joining them together with one half twist. So this, the green region is really a Mobius strip. Um, a single rectangle joined um, with two, two opposite sides with a half twist. Um, and a Mobius strip is the same as RP2 takeaway disk. The white region is really a, a T2 takeaway disk, uh, which you could hopefully convince yourself of if you stare at it for long enough. Um, uh, so therefore, uh, RP2 connects some RP2 connects some RP2 is isomorphic to T2 connects some RP2. Um, so something worth noting is that if you compare these two ends, you see that T2 connects some RP2 is isomorphic to K connects some RP2. Um, but T2 is not isomorphic to, T, T, to K. So that means that you can't cancel connected sums. Um, if a surface, if X connects some Z is isomorphic to Y connects some Z, you don't know that X is isomorphic to Y. Um, so, um, algebraically, surfaces with the direct sum form a monoid, uh, an abelian monoid. Um, so a monoid is like a group without the operation of uh, inversion. Um, and for monoids, you can't necessarily cancel uh, additions. <coughs> okay, so this, this isomorphism will be uh, important later. Okay, next let's talk about orientations uh, and orientability, which I've alluded to um, several times already. Um, so let's make a definition. The Mobius strip M is um, the rectangle, um, this rectangle here as I've drawn it, but it's a rectangle which is a closed interval naught one times an open interval naught one uh, with uh, side identifi identifications. So we identify zero comma y with one comma one minus y. So in this picture, uh, the dotted lines mean the uh, open edges, uh, which don't get identified. And then we have two closed edges uh, here and there. And we identify them in the opposite directions. So that's why we have a, a y being identified with one minus y. So we basically take this, re this rectangle with two closed sides, two open sides, we identify the closed sides in opposite directions. Um, so here's a picture of the Mobius strip uh, embedded uh, in three-dimensional space. You can make one yourself by taking a, a long strip of paper um, curling it round, giving it a half twist, and then uh, cellar taping the edges together. Um, so a, a fun thing, uh, which I'm sure you already know about the Mobius strip, is that it's only got one side. Um, so you, know, you can follow this, because if you kind of locally that your piece of paper has two sides, but if you follow it round um, strip, then because you've Put a half turn in, you've identified those two sides by going uh, around the strip. Okay, so we define a surface X to be orientable if it does not contain any open subset homeomorphic to uh, the Mobius strip M. So that's uh, a very um, economic way of uh, defining the notion of orientability. Um, now, here's a, an equivalent, slightly more complicated point of view, which is that we have a notion of orientation on surfaces. Um, so an orientation on a surface X is, roughly speaking, a consistent notion of clockwise everywhere on our surface X. So if we think about um, 
x is locally looking like r2, then uh, in r2 we have a notion of clockwise, um, you know, which is uh, what's the clockwise rotation, what's the anti-clockwise rotation. Um, and a reflection, for example, uh, of the map from R2 to itself uh, would reverse orientation. Would the reflection turns clockwise into anti-clockwise? Um, so, and when we say a, a notion of clockwise ever on X, uh, I want this notion of clockwise to deform continuously in a suitable sense. Okay, so the Mobius strip does not possess an orientation. Um, so you can perhaps convince yourself and you take this picture. So I've kind of notionally cut my Mobius strip along this pink line. So I'm starting here by choosing an orientation, which is going to rotate clockwise uh, in that way, as kind of seen from looking in. So now let's let's me let's deform our notion of clockwise continuously around the uh, Mobius strip. So as I deform it around this corner, uh, it appears to now be rotating that way. But now the Mobius strip undergoes this half turn and it kind of turns the thing over. So now my notion of clockwise looks like that. And then I go around another corner. Now my notion of clockwise looks like that. Um, so I started with some notion of clockwise here. I've deformed it all the way around the Mobius strip. And now it's turned into the opposite. Okay, so um, you you can go for a walk around here and then you come back and clockwise has turned into anti-clockwise. Um, okay, so the Mobius strip doesn't have an orientation. Therefore, any surface containing the Mobius strip as an open set also cannot have an orientation because an orientation, a notion of clockwise on your surface would restrict to a notion of orientation on the Mobius strip, which doesn't exist. Okay, now, conversely, um, uh, if x can't be oriented, then there has to be some loop in x such that walking all the way around that loop uh, would turn clockwise into an anticlockwise. Because otherwise, uh, you could fix a notion of clockwise at some point in x, and then for any other point in x, assuming x is connected, uh, you could choose a path from uh, your point to that other point, deform your notion of clockwise along it, and that would tell you what clockwise looked like at the second point you chose. And that answer should be independent of paths, because if it wasn't, you could choose two paths between the first point and the second point, such that uh, deforming around the two paths in a loop uh, would reverse orientation, and therefore... Um, Okay, so if you can't orient to x, then there should be some loop in x, such that deforming round that loop turns clockwise into anticlockwise, then a small neighbourhood of that loop should be a Mobius strip. Okay, so um, defining orientations on x is a bit more complicated because you have to say what you mean by a notion of clockwise. There are rigorous ways of doing that. Um, and then the surface is orientable if and only if it admit an orientation exists on x. If x is connected, um, then if it's orientable, there are exactly two orientations on X, um, one of which is kind of clockwise, the other which is anticlockwise in some sense. Um, there are notation, there is a notion of orientation actually in arbitrary numbers of dimensions. Um, in three dimensions, uh, orientations, uh, are, are really specifying right-handed or left-handed. So if you think about your right hand, well, you can, Stick, for example, your thumb up that way, your first finger that way, your second finger that way. Uh, if you do the same thing with your left hand, you get a different kind of picture. If you reflect yourself in a mirror, your right hand will look like your left hand. Now, if the three-dimensional space we lived in was not oriented, you could go for a walk, um, walk around a loop, come back to where you started, uh, but everything would appear to have been reflected in a mirror. So, you know, your newspapers would now look backwards, um, it would be uh, written right to left, and so on. Um, <clears throat> okay, so um, for a planar model, um, x, uh, x is orientable if and only if 
Uh, every pair of glued edges are oriented in a pair, one going clockwise around the polygon, the other going anti-clockwise. Um, so um, here's an example of something where um, both of these, so, so this, this edge here is oriented that way, which is anti-clockwise around X. That edge there is oriented uh, that way, which again is anti-clockwise around X. So what I've done is I've drawn a strip um, between um, intervals on the interior of this edge. Um, and this strip, it's a rectangle with side identifications here and here. And because these are both going the same way around X, this, uh, they're kind of, the side identifications are happening in the opposite way. So this gives you a Mobius strip. Um, Okay, so in terms of the writing your planar model as a word, um, so here, uh, starting from that edge, um, the word is A, B inverse, C inverse, A inverse, B, C inverse. Um, uh, so the way to test a planar model to see if it's orientable or not uh, is that it will be orientable if and only if, in your word, each symbol A and B and C appears once as an A and once as an A inverse. So um, you don't get repeats. So in this case, I've got a C inverse and a C inverse there. Um, so this rule does not happen. Um, uh, if you have a repeated symbol A and A or A inverse and A inverse, then you can draw a strip across your um, planar model there and it will be a Mobius strip. And then by definition, um, if your surface contains a Mobius strip, uh, then it's not orientable. <coughs> okay, now this is a, a, a necessary and sufficient condition for orientability for planar models, um, as you can convince yourself uh, that you can, if, if each symbol appears once as A and once as A inverse, then you can actually construct an orientation uh, on your surface using basically if you use the standard notion of clockwise uh, in your polygon, then the side identifications um, preserve that notion of clockwise as you cross the side. Okay, so let's look at some examples. S2, T2, RP2, and K. Uh, they can be given as um, uh, planar models. S2 is A, A inverse, B, B inverse, as we've seen in the pictures we drew in the previous lecture. So here, the A and the A inverse appear in pairs, B and B inverse appear in pairs, so that's orientable. T2 is A, B inverse, A inverse, B. So here the A and the A inverse are in a match pair, B inverse and B are in a match pair. That's also orientable. RP2 is A, B, A, B. So the A and the A here are not in a match pair. Uh, that violates orientability. The Bs also violate orientability but you only need orientability to be broken once for it not to be orientable. So RP2 is not orientable. The Klein bottle K, we can write as A, B inverse, A, B. Well, the Bs are okay here, but the As are not. The A appears with an A rather than A inverse, so that's not a match pair. That violates orientability. So the Klein bottle is not orientable. Okay, so um, for a surface to be orientable or not, is a homeomorphism invariant. Um, so in this case, well, the other characteristic of T2 is equal to the other characteristic of K, they're both zero. But we can distinguish the torus T2 and the Klein bottle K, because one of them is orientable, T2, and one of them is not. So therefore, T2 and K um, cannot be um, <coughs> uh, cannot be homeomorphic. Connect sums. A connect sum x connect sum y is orientable if and only if x and y are both orientable. Um, if you want to see that, then, well, if x contains a Mobius strip, so it's not orientable, then we can choose the disk uh, which we cut out to make the connect sum x connect sum y uh, to be disjoint from the Mobius strip, and then x connect sum y will also contain that Mobius strip as an open subset of x. So if x is not orientable, then x and x and y is not orientable. And similarly for y, if x and y are orientable, 
you can choose orientations on x and y and then we can arrange that those orientations induce an orientation on the connexome x connexome y <clears throat> okay so now i want to come to the um, the classification of surfaces uh, this is the main theorem of this part of the course um, I suggest that you should learn a statement of the classification of surfaces. Um, so the proof of this theorem is not examinable, as um, you'll find in the synopses. Okay, so the statement, uh, theorem 2.2, is that if X is a compact and connected surface, then one of two things happen. Uh, they're exclusive possibilities. Firstly, either x is orientable, and if x is orientable, then x is homeomorphic to a surface sigma g, um, for g is greater than zero, so g is zero, one, two, and so on. Um, so sigma zero is defined to be the two-sphere S2. Sigma g is defined to be the connected sum of g copies of the two torus, for g at least one. Um, and as we already know, in this case, chi of x is 2 minus 2g. Two um, the second possibility is that x is not orientable. And in this case, x is homeomorphic to a connected sum of h copies of rp2. So x is rp2, connect sum, connect sum rp2. The h is at least 1. So we don't have an h equals 0 case here because that will be s2, but s2 is orientable. Okay, and in this case, chi of x is 2 minus h. Okay, um, so you can see from this that x is actually determined, up to homeomorphism, by its Euler characteristic, chi of x, and whether or not it's orientable, or not orientable. And that follows from the statement, because if x is orientable, then x is sigma g for some g, and you can recover g from this Euler characteristic formula. If x is not orientable, then it's connect sum of h rp2, so some h, and again you can recover the h from knowing the Euler characteristic here. Okay, so um, you can ask similar questions uh, for classification of manifolds of various kinds in higher dimensions. Um, so there are notions of topological manifolds, um, or smooth manifolds, and so on, um, in dimensions three and four, any dimension you like. Um, in higher dimensions, the situation is far more complicated. Um, if you wanted to, to classify compact, connected three-dimensional manifolds, for example, um, the answer to that is very complicated and not entirely known. Um, for example, uh, you may know something about the the, the Poincaré conjecture in three dimensions has uh, recently been solved by uh, Perelman. Um, that's the Poincaré conjecture is just asking whether we understand the simplest three dimensional manifold broadly, whether some condition is enough to make sure your three manifold is actually uh, the three sphere. Uh, so two dimensions are, are particularly simple. So that's why this is a, a satisfying theorem. Um, so we've got conditions here of being compact and connected. Um, you can throw away the condition of being connected if you like. Any non-connected surface is just a disjoint union of um, some other, some collection of connected surfaces. If your surface is compact but not connected, then it's this disjoint union of finitely many connected compact surfaces. So if you omitted connected here, then X would just be a disjoint union of a finite number of pieces from this list. If you throw away non-compact, if you throw away compact, then things can get more complicated. You can have things with infinitely many ends doing weird stuff. Um, so we probably don't want to get into the classification of non-compact surfaces. Okay, so let's talk about uh, a sketch proof of um, this theorem. Um, you can find the more detailed treatments in the at the Hitchin online lecture notes. So I'm going to divide it into several steps. The first step, step one, is just the fact that x emits a triangulation. Um, so that's a theorem I claimed 
in section 2.4, theorem 2.1, although uh, I didn't give you a proof. Okay, uh, the second step is to show that any surface, any compact connected surface X admits a planar model. Uh, and the proof is by starting with a sub with your triangulation, um, and then you modify it to reduce the number of faces until you end up with one face. Okay, so one way to say this is let's take a subdivision of X with the minimal number of faces for possible subdivisions of X. And we know that at least one subdivision of X exists because uh, a triangulation of X is a subdivision, a subdivision in which every face has three edges, um, and um, therefore um, we've already claimed that triangulations exist. Okay, so if the minimal number of faces is strictly greater than one, um, then because X is connected, two of these, two of the faces must be, must meet along an edge, and then you can glue two neighboring faces along an edge, um, and that will reduce the number of faces by one, by one, the number of edges by one, that will contradict the minimality. So therefore, um, uh, X uh, admits a, um, a subdivision with, uh, with one, um, <coughs> with, with just one face. Um, okay. So, and that's basically a planar model. Okay, our third step is to claim that X admits a planar model with only one vertex. Um, okay, well, there's a special case uh, we have to um, count here, uh, have to exclude here. So X can be a two-sphere written like this as a two-gon uh, with uh, two edges and two vertices identified like this. Um, so, in fact, you can write a two-sphere S2 uh, in a cellular decomposition with one face and one vertex and no edges um, by uh, essentially taking a, a two-disc and mapping the boundary of the two-disc to a single point in S2. So, uh, if you Somehow, the, the way to include S2 in the in the picture uh, with only one vertex is to have no edges, uh, but that doesn't really fit into our planar model picture um, because we need a naught con, uh, a, um, a a kind of a polygon with no no edges. Okay, um, so the reason this is true is if you had a planar model with um, more than one vertex, then uh, you can find two uh, distinct vertices uh, in your planar model linked by an edge, and you basically shrink that edge to a point. So let's suppose we, so this is, there's our polygon, there's another bit of the same polygon uh, identified along this edge, the two vertices, you shrink that edge to zero length, and uh, then you've reduced the number of vertices by one and the number of edges by one. Um, now, you can't do that with this two-seer presentation, because if you shrunk that edge to, to nothing, you also shrink that edge to nothing, and then you'd actually end up with, um, as I explained, the cellular de decomposition of S2 into a single face and a single vertex, but no edges. <coughs> um, okay, so we can reduce to one vertex. Uh, so therefore, uh, X has a, a decomposition a subdivision uh, with one vertex and one face and n edges um, coming from gluing sides of a 2n gon. Um, uh, and in that case, chi of x is 2 minus n, um, so therefore the Euler characteristic of x has to be less than or equal to 2. So that's a, uh, a new fact we didn't know that if you have a connected, a compact connected surface, then its Euler characteristic has to be less than or equal to two. Um, okay, so from this presentation, you think that the Euler characteristic was less than equal to one, but as above, we have to include the special case X is S2, which has two vertices, one face and one edge, uh, and Euler characteristic is two. So you can't shrink the edge to reduce to one vertex without having no edges. <coughs> okay, um, so 
the fact that the other characteristic of surfaces is less than or equal to two uh, is going to be important in the next steps. Okay, so our fourth stop, step, um, we start to use the orientability. Um, so if x is not orientable, then the planar model has to have two glued edges uh, with the same orientation. So here, for example, that edge and this edge are both going clockwise around uh, x. Um, and you can draw a Mobius strip m joining these. Um, and if you cut x into the Mobius strip and the rest of it, then uh, the Mobius strip is RP2, take away disk. Uh, the rest of it is some other surface y, take away a disk. Um, so you can essentially pull this m out as a uh, connect sum with RP2. So therefore, if x is not orientable, we can write x is y connect sum RP2, um, and then the connect sum formula uh, for Euler characteristics together with the Euler characteristic of RP2 being 1 will tell you that chi of y is chi of x plus 1. Um, Okay, so then we do our same trick. We represent y as a planar model with uh, one vertex, one face, and n edges, let's say, n y edges. Uh, so then n y, which is the number of um, y edges, is n x minus one. Um, okay, so we've actually, y is simpler than x, because it has one fewer edges. Um, and we've uh, we've increased the Euler characteristic of y, but we already know that the Euler characteristic of y is bounded above by 2. So we've got the basis of induction here. Uh, we can only pull out finitely many RP2s uh, before we get to something where we can't pull out any more. Uh, okay, um, so if x is not orientable, we can pull out an RP2 as a connect sum. Um, okay, a kind of parallel thing. Uh, if x is orientable, um, by drawing a slightly more complicated picture, we can show that uh, either x is y connect sum uh, 2 torus t2, in which case chi of y is chi of x plus 2, and the number of edges in the planar model for y is the number of edges for x minus 2. Either that happens, or x has to be a two-sphere. Um, and you can uh, prove this by uh, cutting and pasting uh, planar models. <coughs> um, so you can uh, you can see some uh, sequence of pictures which do this in the Hitchin lecture notes. Okay, so uh, finally, let's use an induction on n, which is uh, the number of edges appearing in our planar model. <coughs> um, so if x is orientable, then x has to be the connect sum of g copies of t2, because, um, well, we can use step 5 repeatedly. Um, if x is orientable, we can pull out either x is s2, or we can pull off a t2. And so we keep pulling off um, copies of t2 by connected sum until we can't anymore. And we can't go on forever, because each time uh, we pull off a copy of t2, we increase, increase the other characteristic by 2, but we also know that the other characteristic is bounded above by 2. Okay, so if x is orientable, then it's, it is a connected sum of some number of t2s. <coughs> if x is not orientable, then by a similar trick, we can pull out rp2s by, um, by connect sum uh, until the point where it becomes orientable. So we, we can, let's say h is the maximum number of rp2s we can pull out by um, connected sum. Then the result, uh, so then after we've done that, we get something which is orientable, and then that is a number of, uh, a g number, copy of g2s. Okay, so apparently this would make us think that the classification of surfaces for non-orientable surfaces should involve two numbers, a g and an h. However, uh, by an example earlier in the lecture, we know that T2 connects on RP2 is isomorphic to RP2 connects on RP2 connects on RP2. So here we have at least one RP2 there. So by taking one of these RP2s, we can convert each copy of these T2s into two lots of RP2. So therefore, X is 
uh, isomorphic to the connect sum of 2g plus h copies of rp2. Okay, um, and then that finishes uh, result. If we go back and look at the theorem, um, <coughs> we're saying if x is orientable, then it's a connect sum of some number g of uh, t2s, um, and we already know that the old characters of x is 2 minus 2g. If x is not orientable, then x is homeomorphic to a connect sum of some number of rp2s. The number of rp2s is at least 1, and that's its uh, other characteristic there.